So we're just going to wait for the attendees to roll in. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll be starting in just a few moments. Um, I'm just going to take this time to wait for uh, all of the audience members to join. And in the meantime, I'm going to set up the Facebook Live, uh, which you're also all welcome to, to share with your, with your own Facebook followers. <laughs> okay, great. So we are, we're ready now to take it away. Um, so, uh, thank you everybody for joining us, to our esteemed panelists and also to our audience members. Uh, welcome to the sixth panel of CPIR uh, Big Data Digital Discussion Series on COVID-19 and Food Security. The CPIR platform for big data and agriculture works to harness the capabilities of big data to solve agricultural development problems faster better and at greater scale, basically feeding the future bite by bite. Uh, we launched this online discussion series to bring emergent research and on the ground realities together in conversation in order to map out the direct impacts of COVID-19 across food value chains and to glean data-driven recommendations and solutions. For today's panel, we will be discussing uh, how to build resilient food systems for the future looking at new technologies such as blockchain, artificial intelligence, and the importance of nutrition. So we're very happy to welcome today Marik uh, de Reit de Ruiz, <laughs> founder of The New Fork, uh, Christine Chege, uh, agri-nutrition and food systems specialist at the Alliance of Biodiversity International at SIAD, and Shristi Singh, a student at the Indian Institute of Technology in Patna. Um, so before we uh, start with our first panelist, um, I just wanted to share with you a couple um, tips on how to best engage with our speakers. So um, after each presentation, we uh, encourage uh, questions from the audience. You can shoot them through while they are still presenting if a question does arise. Um, and you just pop it in. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you've got a little Q&A function there. So just be sure to pop your questions in there to, so that we can so that we don't miss them, um, and we'll have these answered at the end of each of the each of the panelists' um, uh, presentations. So if your question also doesn't get answered right away, we will have an opportunity to address it once all the panelists have finished presenting. Um, I'm also going to share with you a um, it's a share board. So the idea between, behind this, it's just an Excel document. Um, that way, if you do want to engage with the speakers um, and also with other audience members to maybe collaborate on some of these solutions and challenges that you've seen arise from uh, during this pandemic, you can fill out your details there, specifying um, uh, the challenges you're facing or maybe solutions that you found, and also any opportunities to either ask for, you know, help with something or to offer help uh, to somebody else. So the link has just been added uh, now. So oh, hang on a minute. I've just added it. Let me be sure that you can all access. Um, so it's in the it's in the chat now. So you're welcome to to open that up and, and fill out your details. So going on to the first panelist. Um, the first speaker today is Christine. Uh, she's an agri-nutrition and food system specialist with the Alliance of Biodiversity International in SIA. She has over 10 years experience working on agriculture nutrition linkages and her research focuses on consumer behavior, understanding and intervening in the food environments to improve nutrition, value chains for nutrition, sustainable food systems, nutrition and food security, inclusive business models, private sector engagement and market system development. She is also one of the leads She's the lead of uh, one of our Inspire Challenge projects, funded by the Big Data Inspire Challenge Initiative. Uh, her project, Hungry Cities, Inclusive Food Markets in Africa, um, won the Inspire Challenge uh, uh, last year. Um, so we're going to also pop a little link in there. So as she gives her presentation, you're welcome to, to check out her project. You can see the timeline and, and the amazing work that they've done so far. So Christine, thank you so much for joining us and, and you're welcome to take it away from here. Thank you very much for that uh, very good introduction. So um, I'll share my presentation right away. Thank you. 
let us know if you need any help, uh, Christine. Yes. <laughs> I'm just trying to share it. I don't know why it's not popping up. Just okay. a minute, it should be coming up. Um, uh, in okay. the mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Okay. So thank you. Thank you once more um, for the people present. So just to quickly go through uh, uh, food systems, when you talk of the current food system situation, how does it look like? And uh, so that we can get into perspective of understanding when we talk of a future food system, what are we looking at? So in the current situation, we are really facing a lot of challenges, for instance, the growing population. And here we see um, the projected figures of getting to over 10 getting over 10 to over 10 billion by 2050. Of course, that will have high demand in terms of food. There are challenges in terms of food security and nutrition. More and more people are getting malnourished. Uh, uh, and that's in terms of uh, malnutrition, undernutrition, micronutrient deficiencies, but also in terms of overweight and obesity. So this is also becoming a big challenge to several countries, including developing countries. Also, there's an issue with the uh, post-harvest loss and food waste. So we see figures in the tune of 30 to 40% of food that is supposed to be consumed by humans weighing into waste. Actually, it's not getting to the consumer's plate. So that's also a big challenge. Sorry. Then there's also the challenge of uh, increased need for uh, food, transport, food transport. And of course, this has an implication on um, our environment. And finally, the challenge on climate change, which is affecting our food uh, system. So when we talk of a future food system, how do we want to have a, what kind of a future food system are we looking at? Um, and this is a food system that is uh, able to account for human health and nutrition, economic and environmental impact. So there's really need to have tremendous changes in our food system, starting with change in the consumption pattern so that we can have more of a consumption of healthy and nutritious diets compared to the, um, less nutritious processed ultra processed foods for example also there is need to reduce uh, food loss and waste uh, so that we can be able to um, account for better foods to our consumers then also there is need to shorten the food supply chain possibly so maybe looking at the possibility of uh, strongly focusing on more regional and local food supplies um, the other aspect is the issue of looking at the role of wholesale and retail markets. So asking ourselves, what does the, the wholesale markets and retail markets, um, uh, what kind of role do they play to, in our food system? How, what kind of food environment do they present to our consumers? And then uh, finally, what's the role of the private sector? Can we support the private sector an important role in changing our food system to a better food system to feed the current generation and the future generation? And the big question today is then, how does the, the big data uh, what role does the, does the big data play? How can it contribute to changing all these food system aspects to make it a better food system for the future? So here I present to you um, some of, some of the, uh, one of the projects we are implementing on uh, improving nutri nutrition through distribution of fresh fruits and vegetables in urban Nairobi, Kenya. And this through the Hungry Project, uh, Feeding Hungry Cities project that has just been mentioned. So this in partnership with the Trigger uh, a private company in Nairobi and the Alliance of Biovast International in SEAT. So quickly, just to show you how the model plays, um, Trigger Foods links all its distribution um, actors, like the distribution sourcing model with the distribution, they have a cooling system, uh, transportation of their commodities uh, through their vehicles, which have been installed with the cooling system, therefore reducing uh, food waste, uh, spoilage, uh, of course, meaning you get better food at the end of the um, uh, at the end of the chain, and then it links all the way to the uh, retailers and finally to the consumers. And the entire system is linked with um, uh, a technology, uh, mobile phone technology. So you are able to make uh, communicate with the producers, communicate with the retailers, uh, and there are all these feedback loops whenever you're checking for quality and all these aspects. So uh, the entire chain. Um, better uh, supply of commodities from the producers who are small scale farmers, but also the medium sized farmers that they're, they're dealing with and, and getting the food available to the plate of the consumers in, uh, in the urban areas. 
So in the project, the, the Alliance of Biodiversity uh, International NCF then comes in to provide technical support in terms of the research evidence of how we can use the big data to better understand how to thin the urban population, uh, providing research in terms of the consumer studies, market studies, data modeling, structuring the data that is already available to be able to answer these research questions on how to better thin the population in the urban areas, and specifically looking at the consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables. Also, we develop uh, data capture tools for the wholesale retail markets and consumers to understand, for example, what exactly are the needs of the consumers and how can they, how can the private, such a private sector who is intervening in this space of the food system be able to um, address the needs of the consumers and not just supplying any commodities. So uh, one of the recent Sundays we conducted just the last few months uh, was to assess the impact of COVID-19 on consumption behavior of uh, the same urban population in Nairobi. And, and the, some of the findings we see here are that really uh, COVID-19 is affecting consumption or rather food security of urban population. There's a big impact on the slum consumers and there's also an equally a big impact on the uh, non-slum consumers. So we see the green bar there is the slum consumers. Over 90% also are affected in terms of the kind of food they're consuming. They eat lesser meals. They eat smaller meals in terms of uh, uh, the proportions because they don't, uh, they don't have enough food to eat. They have limited varieties. They're not able to eat the kind of food they prefer. And simply they, they relate this to the COVID-19 uh, situation. And then when we, we get into the details of um, what, how is the consumption uh, of fresh fruits and vegetables by these consumers looking like in terms of frequency and quantity. So we see, for example, here, the rent um, highlights under the slums. We see 92% of the slum dwellers have reduced their consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables in terms of quantity and also frequency. And for the non-slum consumers, um, uh, around 55% have changed, have reduced their consumption, whereas 43% have not reduced consumption. And we, we, when we ask them the reasons why they are reducing the consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables, we see for the uh, slum consumers, the biggest concern is that their incomes have reduced. And this is because these slum consumers were relying on uh, informal jobs. And now with the restrictions that have been implemented by the government, there's less um, job opportunities for them. Therefore, their incomes have reduced. So they have a big challenge with reduction in incomes and therefore they're not able to consume these uh, fruit, fresh fruits and vegetables. Whereas for the non-slum consumers, it's mainly because they feel fresh fruits and vegetables have become more expensive. Then when we are looking at the fresh fruits, how the consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables has been before the COVID-19 and after, or rather during the COVID-19 period, we see, uh, so here the, 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 the blue bar is the consumption of the different types of uh, vegetables um, is the consumption before the COVID-19 and the green is after the, or rather during the COVID-19 period. So we see there is a tremendous decrease in consumption of all the fruits and all the vegetables, except the kills. So the kills here are like the cheapest vegetables you can get in the Nairobi market. Therefore their consumption has actually been increasing uh, during the COVID-19 but the rest, the consumption has tremendously decreased significantly. And the same, uh, we see the same uh, trend on consumption of fresh fruits. Um, and this is specifically for the slum households. So we see, again, a tremendous change or rather decrease in consumption of fruits by these slum households. Some of the uh, fruit items, for example, mangoes may be due to seasonal effects, but broadly all the others really is, um, uh, is because of the COVID and they say, they are reducing their consumption because they're not able, they can't afford, they don't have the money, and therefore they, they don't eat um, much of these uh, fruits. So broadly we see COVID is really affecting how the consumers, what kind of consumers, uh, the fruit, what kind of food, sorry, the consumers are consuming. And definitely, definitely these will have an effect on the nutrition and food security of this population. And we see a role for private sector here. If they get this kind of information then, can they uh, tweak that information, make use of it, and then be able to supply the kind of foods, um, fruits and vegetables, these nutritious foods to these target consumers so that we can have a lesser impact uh, in terms of nutrition and food security. Thank you. Thanks, thank you so much, Christine. That, that's 
it's in, that's just so impressive um, that you've been able to track this and uh, what a significant uh, change in um, in that you know I mean it must have had such an incredible impact um, uh, on on the consumers so yeah fantastic project I, I guess I I would be very interested to know um, so what has what have have you done within your project to try to uh, address this this issue? Um, yeah, I would love to hear more to hear more about that. Yes. So within the project, like I mentioned, we were working with the Trigger Fund, the private company. So uh, they're already in the business of uh, supplying the fresh fruits and vegetables to consumers. So with this resource, then uh, we of course we've shared and discussed the results with them. And they are now in the process of finding how can they uh, restructure their supply system. Uh, for example, where the consumers are saying they don't have access to these mm. foods, fresh fruits and vegetables. For the trigger foods, they have not increased the prices of their commodities before and after COVID. Their supply system is the same because they have a direct um, sourcing mechanism uh, from the farmers and they are linked all the way to the consumer. So they are, they are responding. It, it might be, do you want to, uh, quickly go back to that slide that shows the um, supply chain. That one? Yes, exactly. So, I mean, is this po uh, pr uh, pre-COVID or, or, or now post during COVID, I should say? This is pre-COVID. Uh, Pre-COVID and it remains the same even during the COVID period. So pre-COVID, pre this is how the structure, the, the supply chain was looking like and it's still looking the same. So they are sourcing their produce from the farmers and linking all the way. Um, and now where we are playing a role and really trying to strengthen within the project is the link with the, with the mobile technology. So we are developing even more mm. applications to link with the farmers, to, to link with, sorry, with the consumers and to link with the retail market and the wholesale market so that they can be able to respond better even during this specific period of time of a COVID situation. That's fantastic. And, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I would love to see uh, on this diagram, I mean, how, um, uh, which areas you, you, you had to strengthen. Uh, and also, I'm curious to know, how did you, um, how did, how were they able to keep those prices down? You said that they didn't change the prices for the consumers. Is, is, is that correct? Yes. Yes. So how were they able to do that? Is that because of those direct links to the farmers? Yes. One of their strongest advantages is that they have, they are sourcing direct from the farmers and they have their own um, uh, transportation mechanism. So like the, the, the vans for transportation of uh, commodities from the farmers to their warehouses. So they are really using their own transportation and they are sourcing directly from the farmers. Some of them, they have contract. most of them actually they have contracts with, and they have, uh, others they have oral agreements with. So they source directly from them and they are able to supply uh, to their warehouse and then supply to the vendors who then sell to the consumers. So even during the COVID season, they said they have not had a feeling or a need for changing their prices because first they see people are struggling to get the food, Second, they don't really even have uh, any additional cost in terms of uh, like they're getting the raw material at a higher cost or not. So it's still the same for them and they're supplying at the same prices. And actually during this COVID also they have opened up uh, other avenues to assess food because as we know with the restrictions in movement and all these other um, restrictions that are put in place, uh, not many people are able to go to the outlets to purchase food. So they have also opened online um, online sales points, so where people can buy their commodities still through the online system. Mm. And uh, were there any sort of big changes that you've had to any other changes you've had to make make um, in response to to this pandemic? Uh, one of the big changes I would say it's how how we did the studies. Okay, because initially the initial idea was that we would do a face-to-face -face study to get the, the contact to the different, act, different uh, consumers. We would have like a, a, a bigger coverage like for the many areas within Nairobi. But then when we were just starting the study, the COVID-19 hit us. So we had to quickly change um, how to start the studies and we were able to do it using the mobile application. So telephone calls and very few 
uh, key informant interviews, but most of them were through the telephone interviews. Um, and quickly then we picked it up uh, and we were able to, to, to have the study conducted. And the next level now we are using, we are going to use the, what we call the 5Q, 5 question, again, another application that we'll use to follow up on how, on, to understand how the consumers are going on with the, with the, with the consumption, what are the challenges still there, or what has lessened, what has become worse, and we are starting these studies next week. That's fantastic, Christine. Um, again, any panelists who want to shoot through any questions to Christine or any audience members, you're really welcome to do that. And uh, if there isn't time to answer them now, we can also answer them at the end of the, uh, once all the panelists have presented. Um, I think we'll move, uh, we'll move on to the next panelist, uh, to Marik. Um, so Marik, thank you so much again, Christine. Um, so, so Marik, uh, Tanzanian-born Marik is the founder of The New Fork, a blockchain for, agri -food company, for an agri-food company based in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. She started her career with computer science at Wagner University and worked on farm data for 20 years in over 40 different countries. New technologies like blockchain accelerate positive impact on farmers, consumers, and their global society. The New Fork is passionate about increasing the adoption of new tech in global supply chains. Uh, Manik, thank you so much for joining us today. Please, please tell us a little bit more about that. Yes, I will. Yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, I'm talking to you from uh, Amsterdam. Previously, when we were preparing this session, uh, you, you said that maybe this is some of, uh, you know, because of the green, some more tropical area, but we're in Amsterdam and we're based in uh, uh, the startup scene of Amsterdam, which is located at Science Park. Um, the new fork is um, three years old now and we focus on, on new technologies um, pretty much dominated by blockchain at this very moment. Um, and of course, my, my question to the previous presentation um, is, of course, on, on technology, what technologies are you using and how do you see that technologies can help you strengthen what you're doing at this moment? But I'm sure we'll get back in the, the, the wider discussion. Um, let me start sharing my screen and then take you through uh, a few slides. So I'm sure you can see my screen now. Uh, basically, uh, I, I don't really want to talk about the new fork. I want to talk about uh, one thing that we're doing. So as the new fork, we implement blockchain technologies with agri-food systems. So we do that for big corporates like um, Al Del Hez, like uh, Refresco, PepsiCo, Kraft Heinz. But we also help the industry, the agri-food industry, understand, grasp what the technology is and how you can work with it. And we do that in uh, something that is called the Strike 2 Summit. Um, we've pulled this together since last year with quite a number of partners. Uh, you see here, the up you see the partners uh, and below you see the partners that were very more they, that were more intensely involved on on the technical side and that's where you see CJAR uh, and FAO of course World Bank CTA I'm sure most of you will know CTA um, and what we did there is and what we are doing there is to help people understand technology and apply it into their real life context um, I'll, I'll share the link to the to the strike to summit this year uh, in a minute after this but um, when COVID hit our faces in March, we actually decided to come together with uh, most of these partners that you see here. And we decided to have bi-weekly calls in order to understand what was happening. Because uh, I think now uh, we already, uh, well, four or five months in, 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 in our new world uh, that has uh, a pandemic very globally felt but uh, back then it was very difficult to understand what, what what this new world was was going to be so in these calls with the partners that you just saw we had very low-tech conversations on what do you see happening in your corner of the food system and that really was very functional for 
everybody and we agreed on one thing is that there is an information chaos a core factor in that chaos is um, actually the the digital aspect of our food system so if a border closes in vietnam for the export of rice we have very little insight into how fast and how big that impact will be on the food system because data systems are not connected and the infrastructure, the digital infrastructure of our food system is still, uh, well, it, it's emerging, we're just starting. So what we said is that we need to evolve from the middle of this picture to the right of this picture. So uh, in the middle, you see where most of our economies are still uh, located. There are even quite a, a number of economies that are, that are on the left side, which is a very centralized model. In the middle, you see a decentralized model. And um, increasingly, at global level, you see business models evolving in a decentralized fashion. And that is where you have to think of the Ubers, the Airbnbs, the, the Facebooks. But there's still a central unit in it. Now, the moment something breaks in that central unit, or something uh, very chaotic like, uh, like COVID-19 happens, it's a very prone and fragile system. If we move towards what you call uh, a network economy, or uh, in more technical terms, a distributed economy, which is the right of the picture, then the system is much more robust. And uh, the best example of uh, an economy that works in the fashion that is visualized on the right here is uh, a cryptocurrency that is called Bitcoin. Um, I, will, I can explain a bit more on that, but basically I think most of you will know cryptocurrencies. That's where you have no bank and you and I can transfer value from A to B without anybody in between. So it's very much peer to peer. Now, the conclusion was, is that we need a network food system, an open agri-food economy. And then the next phase of our discussion was, how do we get there? Uh, so we had a lot of, um, yeah, we had a lot of sessions where um, this was one of the, the key sessions where we said, so if we map technologies, what do we think is the most significant technology that can help us move from the middle to the right end of that picture? And then uh, most of us thought that that was blockchain. Now, what is blockchain? Um, and if anything, from, from, from this few minutes of mine, um, I, I'm, I would really like to uh, inspire you to get to know more about this technology and try and understand what it means for you. But the reason that it is, uh, it's, it's, you can think of it as an Excel uh, as an Excel sheet or an Excel system with a few differences that everybody has the same copy of that Excel system or sheet. And once I put something in, so once I put a three in, I can never get it out. That for food systems has a very significant impact because you have verifiable information. It's permanent information. So it gives data integrity in a food system. And I am very strongly convinced that data integrity is critical to move from that middle to the right part of that picture. So here's a definition that you can find on Wikipedia, so I will skip it, but just to give you some definition. And the predictions are, and this was before COVID-19, uh, predicted by Gunnar that uh, one in five global grocers will use blockchain for food safety and traceability in only five years. Now, there are other predictions also pre-COVID that say that bigger brands will even um, use blockchain uh, quicker at a larger scale in a shorter uh, time period. And, and COVID, the, the World Economic, Economic Forum also indicated that the, 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 the likeliness uh, of blockchain being adopted in supply chains overall is increasing very rapidly because of uh, the, 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 yeah, I think the reality that we're all feeling that COVID-19 and these sort of challenges bring along. Now, um, before I end here and open it up, the key thing is, I'm sure, uh, I mean, during the, the first 
days of COVID, a lot of images went around social media. And one image that, that I didn't put in this um, presentation, but that, that is very much in the back of my mind, was these three waves where you would have COVID-19, you would have the economic recession, and the biggest wave would be climate change. And I think that that is still very much the case. If anything goes, I hope that COVID-19 woke us all up. And I really uh, yeah, hope that we will embrace technology to a much deeper extent in our food systems that we have been doing um, until today. Um, yeah, so this is my, uh, my contact details. And uh, any questions, uh, I'm open here to, uh, to address. But yeah, key conclusion, uh, COVID-19 showed the weaknesses of our food system. A large part of that weakness is, of course, in, in policies and disconnect policies, international policies, but um, a very strong uh, limitation to react to a crisis is the lack of, of, of access to good data and good information. The, the, I think that what, what really sums it up is that COVID brought, um, made the, the information chaos that we all felt very uh, yeah, up in our face. And we need technology to, to, uh, to loosen and, and, and organize that. Thank you so much, uh, Marik. Marik. So I have a, a first question here coming in from Jorge. Um, and uh, he wants to know, how can you advance blockchain in informal market, markets? So he, he, he clarifies advance as in integrate. Yeah, okay. Uh, first of all, you can use ready to ready uh, blockchain technologies like cryptocurrencies. I'm a strong believer in cryptocurrencies. Uh, cryptocurrencies are very uh, they, they have a very bad reputation, uh, which is not justified. So I think the use of cryptocurrencies really helps in formal markets. If you look at the adoption of cryptocurrencies, it's biggest in countries like Zimbabwe, in countries where the the normal or the formal financial system is very limited, um, if not to say it's broken. That is where you see these sort of new technologies are adopted quickest. And second, there are quite a lot of uh, already, um, yeah, off the shelf blockchain technologies suitable for uh, either uh, the production side of food or market sites. And that's also where you can start using them. Thanks. I, that's a really interesting question um, uh, and and answer as well. I mean, uh, I guess this is uh, when you're talking about cryptocurrency, uh, it is something that I, I guess there is some fear as well that if it is a, a digital currency, would it be affected by market fluctuations? Yeah. Yeah. And this is, I mean, to put it very bluntly, our current system, our current financial system is in in my understanding, very corrupt. It's very political. It's very superficial um, because who decides the gold standard? Who decides exchange markets? Uh, it's big money that makes that clock tick. And it's, I, I'd say, uh, outdated politics that make that system work. Um, I think it's time for a, a pivot on the financial system that is already taking place. And this is in the field of cri cryptocurrencies. One of the reasons why it's got such a bad image is that none of the, uh, the, the, the vested interests are happy with a disrupting system. So it's very inconvenient to have a money system that you cannot control as a government. Hmm. And this is, I mean, I think everybody should really inform itself or yourself to get your own opinion. Don't believe the media get informed and shape your own opinion but uh yeah the, the the image is very bad because of i would say limited communication on on the, the technologies mm. so I, I guess uh a a question after after that i mean talking about this pers this um incorrect pers per perception of blockchain how has this pandemic has it shifted that understanding yeah. um through that increased application 
yeah, it made the need for it uh, much more apparent. So if I am, am I still sharing my screen? I think oh, I, no, I've switched it off, but, but oh, you, yeah. you can, you, you're welcome to, yeah. uh, me to quickly, reopen. Yeah, let me do that quickly because um, you see the picture now eh? and I, yes. I won't make it bigger, but um, so central banks, but also like CGR's data systems, they are in the middle. So you want to have much better access to much more data. And you can only do that if you evolve from the centerpiece of this picture to the right hand of this picture, to the network, data, economy, uh, whatever economy you, you want to label it. So um, the, the adoption of cryptocurrencies is, is definitely increasing because of COVID-19, but um, just so, so cryptocurrency, Cryptocurrencies and blockchain are related, but they're definitely not one and the same. Blockchain is the technology and Bitcoin is a use case of that technology. But for example, in food, to create a product passport, we don't use any cryptocurrencies. So you can use blockchain without staying away or with stay, staying away from cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. I guess that that's also um, something I would be interested in, in, in understanding a little more about. I mean, you've seen an increase in, in the application um, during this period. What have, in what areas have you seen it most applied? Um, and could you, in traceability, could you also, I mean, looking at Christine's project as well, for example, looking at nutrition, um, how could blockchain be um, an important part of that infrastructure yeah. with, the, with these uh, food supply chains? Yeah, well, great question. And, and referring back to that same picture without putting it on the screen. So if you look at nutrition, huh? if, if I'm eating um, a product here now with a, a sachet and a, a code or the barcode and, and some vague statement of the nutritional value, that value that I read on my package is all based on data systems that are not necessarily up to date and are definitely not connected. So if you start implementing uh, an, an infrastructure that allows data to communicate, then I suddenly can have um, a QR code that I scan and then I get access to the real information. Because I don't know who in the audience knows that the, the, Q, the, the, the barcode, the information that, are, that is tied on to barcodes, uh, is tied onto a database that is kept by organizations like GS1, which have databases that have been calibrated in the 80s. So the nutritional value of a ingredient has been calibrated a long time ago. And I know that for a lot of, um, uh, a lot of products, the nutritional values are, are definitely different from 20 years ago. So blockchain allows a much more real-time communication of the data that is in a food system. And that is essential for, for nutrition. I think, I mean, we know very little about nutrition uh, in, as a consumer. You know, you buy your, you, you know, how many sugar and how many fats are in it, but that's it. Mm -hmm. um, and really, mm. I, I mean, and, and Christine, I mean, I, I think there would be a great opportunity also to hear your thoughts on this, uh, maybe after, after uh, uh, Marie's presentation. I, I want to um, uh, pull a couple of these questions now from the audience. Uh, Mohammed, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly where the question is there. Would you mind to rephrase it as a question? Um, he, he's, uh, he's made a comment that uh, these cryptocurrencies are very hard to manage and more volatile than the currency we're using, which is something that you address. Um, and Nicholas followed up um, asking, uh, with so many cryptocurrencies turn, will these, oh, so many cryptocurrencies turn into commodities rather than transactional currencies? So what, what will change this? Yeah, yeah. Um, good questions. The, the reason why it's so volatile is that it's a very young market. So it's, um, uh, it's exactly 11 years, the technology itself. The cryptocurrency markets are younger. They're, they're, I would say, like maybe even three years, since three years are really active with more people joining in. Now, more people joining in means that there's a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of trading happening. 
And it's the same traders that are in our commodity markets that are now trading in cryptocurrencies. And they have one objective to get quick money. And that makes it very, very volatile. Mm. But um, yeah, and, and again, I mean, there are also cryptocurrencies that are less volatile. Mm. So this is a, a indication that it's a, it's a young emerging market. Okay. Um, so this is, <laughs> there's been a few comments to this uh, question that's been posted. Um, uh, Jorge, uh, I think he's talking about connectivity, which is what Nicholas uh, has commented as well. Um, so when you talk about blockchain, I mean, you're talking about information that can be up, needs to be updated continuously. Um, correct. So would yeah, but what, what you do? Sorry. So so what you can imagine? If you imagine that network, imagine that that in that that connecting thing is the blockchain. Now what you would do is you would add information to that blockchain. Um, probably on an automated basis. So it would read information from my data system on a, a certain, with, with a certain continuation and automate it. And it would push the information to the network. So everybody can see that information that I'm sharing. Mm. So they're talking about uh, connectivity as far as, so uh, having, does this, is this dependent on having reliable like, electricity access? And I guess um, internet as well, which is what Nicholas is referring to, I, I, I would say. Um, and uh, uh, Jorge is asking what happens in areas that don't have very good connectivity. Yeah. Um, and uh, Nicholas follows up saying that uh, he's, he's looking at uh, Sudan as an example. So yeah. maybe you can comment yeah. on that. Good. Yeah, excellent. Um, so, so connectivity makes life very easy. But um, technologies that make connectivity happen in rural areas are going very fast. So there, there are a few, um, yeah, there, there are a few bigger consortia, and uh, yeah, I would say uh, technology-driven um, uh, consortia that are working on new technologies that make um, that that. I think will make rural areas in, for example, Africa, Sudan, what have you, uh, more connected to uh, than, for example, currently is in the Netherlands. And I think the mobile phone is the best example, you know? I mean, Kenya has the best mobile phone coverage than anywhere. It, it, it's got a better connectivity uh, than we have here in the Netherlands. More people are using a phone in Kenya than in Holland which is really, I think it's, it's a classroom life example of leapfrogging because of new technology and you don't have your legacy of your legacy system. So technologies go very fast. For now, it's more difficult in Sudan than in the Netherlands, but I, I see this changing. I see this changing. Thanks. I, I mean, this is going to sound like a very obvious question to you, uh, Marika, but it would be great to have your definition um, an explanation of it. So you're talking about one of the most important um, value that, that the most important value that blockchain offers is that traceability and I guess also transparency as well. Yeah. Um, and can you explain uh, why that's important for building resilient food systems for the future? Yeah, yeah, it's where it all starts. So if you don't know uh, what you have in your hands as an end product, where do you start? So uh, it starts with traceability, um, but it doesn't end there. It only begins there. Um, if you ask a retailer in the Netherlands at this moment where um, a random pro product category comes from, he cannot answer. And just only the fact that a product will have soy in it is already, um, soy is the most difficult kid in the class where it's a very fragmented half product that is everywhere. And with so many actors in the supply chain, so many traders, so many margins, so many, uh, yeah, just too many players, uh, makes it impossible to trace. So the more complex your product, the more difficult it is to trace. But food systems have gotten so complex to date that we need to sharpen and uh, invest in our, in our digital systems. And the, the, 
what, what you clearly see globally is that because of COVID, there is a strong um, a move backwards to local, locally produced food. But that is only because that is where we can still understand it without digital systems. It's not necessarily a better thing to eat an apple that is grown next to you. For example, for people in the Netherlands, they can better eat an apple from India than uh, from the Netherlands. Because if it's in the Netherlands, it's in the fridge for a whole year. If it's in India, we can ship it to here by ship, which is, has got a reasonable uh, CO2 footprint, and then eat it. So this whole sort of reaction to local is because we have no idea how to deal with the global system. And this is for it. I think it's an indication that you know we're we're just beginning to to improve our food food system. Thank you. I have a question here from Devendra. Uh, they ask um, about IPR on data sharing in blockchain Property. technology. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. I mean, yeah, data, data, this depends on so many factors, but um, basically um, it, it doesn't, the fact that blockchain makes data unforgettable, right? So it registers information in an immutable fashion, has uh, uh, attention with the GDPR. So G in, in Europe, we have the GDPR, which says that you have to have the right to be forgotten. This is uh, a law a regulation that was designed to uh, protect you from the Googles and the Facebooks and, uh, you know, the, the, the data wolves. And I think I'm proud that we have that regulation and that has a tension with, uh, with blockchain because in blockchain, you become unforgettable. And in the law, you have to have the right to be unforgettable. Now, a year or two later, we already have ways around it. We can deal with it. So if that question refers to that, that's the answer. But yeah, on the other hand, on, 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 yeah, on property rights, on data property rights, it's a big theme. Um, most of blockchains are developed in an open source fashion, uh, which makes this whole uh, international property uh, the, the IP uh, debate absolute because it's it's in the public space. Thanks. Uh, I have uh, another question. We 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 uh, uh, seem to have lost uh, um, Shristi a little while back. We've been trying to get her to uh, reconnect. Uh, I think she's having some connectivity issues. So really, uh, we apologize for that. Um, uh, if if we are able to have her join before we finish the session, we will do so. Um, so, uh, another question here from Jorge, um, he's looking at it in, in, um, in the agricultural context. So, uh, he asks, do you have a mental model of the mechanism to make the blockchain technology thrive in ag? Uh, for instance, how do, you make, how, to make, how do you make sure that the learning curve is not too steep, especially in rural areas where there's uh, a, like educational um, disadvantage? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we, we give them, uh, uh, so we do have some sort of mind maps that guide you through, the, it's like a decision tree. Um, we have quite a lot of material on our website, it's called the, the cinema. Um, but most of all, uh, we have a, a blockchain masterclass where you develop your own use case and we help you progress on your own use case. It's on the 24th and 25th of, um, uh, of September. I'll, I'll put in the link. Um, so, so that would be, I would say, the easiest way. And otherwise, give us a call, reach out, and I will help you. Thank you. Um, so I think at, at the moment, that's it. We, we haven't been able to, to reconnect uh, um, Shristi uh, again. So unfortunately, unfortunately um, we're coming to the end of the of this session now. Um, usually we like to take a, a nice uh, screen selfie uh, before we finish. So uh, Christine, if, if you want to, and Hannah, maybe Hannah is, is our um, other comms deputy. She's, she's uh, working behind the scenes to make sure that all the technical 
everything goes smoothly. Um, so we'll take a quick photo <laughs> and then I'm going to pop a couple more links in um, to the chat for, for the audience members. Um, so I guess I'm, Hannah, will you take the screenshot or will? Yeah, or will, I'll okay. be our Zoom photographer. So everyone, everyone put on your biggest smile. Um, <laughs> I'll take a selfie. Three, two, one. Awesome, thanks. Um, so we're having some requests to share the presentation, um, which we can also yeah, do that. Of course. Um, so yeah, we'll also be posting this recording and a few of the other recordings at a later date. Marike, you have fro you froze at the perfect moment. <laughs> Go um, <on. laughs> Um, so, uh, and then, you know, of course you can also submit any other questions to, you know, commenting once we post this on the website. Um, I'm just going to also share a couple of links here, um, to some resources that we have available. Um, we've got, uh, first of all, uh, you can check out some more of the work that, uh, the big data platform has been doing over the past year. Um, and then you can find. Great work. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. I'm going to post this. It's our um, annual report link uh, for what we've done last year. You can also find some really incredible projects like Christine's, Christine's project in there. You can follow the work that they're doing. Um, and uh, yeah, so I really welcome you all to, to take a look. Um, besides that, we also want to invite you to our convention this year. Uh, we usually host the convention in a different uh, in a different place every year, and this year, obviously, we we've had to pivot a little bit, and and we'll now be launching a fully accessible online online and global event. And you're all welcome to join us. Um, it is also the first one CGIR event, so we'll be featuring work from uh, all of the different centers across CGIR. So it's really worth it to have a have a look and um, and to register now. I'm just having a problem like copying this and putting it into the chat, but I've got it now. Um, registration is free as well, um, and it's really worth it to attend. Um, Ma Marik has been one of our presenters the past few years, and uh, she really does a fantastic and engaging um, session on uh, on blockchain. Um, and that's, that's it. Uh, thank you so much to everybody for joining us. Thank you so much, Christine and, and Marik for, for, uh, making the time to, to channel this session. And, um, I guess we'll see you all next week for the, for the next ses session. Yeah. Excellent. Looking forward. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you for your time, everybody on the other side. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care.